Good morning. Uh, as was stated, I'm Kate Chapman. I'm with the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. I'm our executive director. And I'm going to talk about using OpenStreetMap uh, in conjunction with communities to prepare for disasters as well as to respond to them. Uh, but first, I'm going to give a little bit of background. Uh, talking to a crowd of open source enthusiasts, some of this um, might seem like a little review, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, so the first is why OpenStreetMap? Just in general, why do we need it? Um, so most maps that you probably use are, every day are either legally or technically not open and free. Um, did anyone use Google Maps to get here today? Um, you can't download that data and then use it freely however you want. Uh, so we call OpenStreetMap the Wikipedia of maps. Uh, fairly simple, anyone with an account can sign up to add information, uh, correct mistakes, and map as detailed as you want. Um, the rules are pretty simple. In general, it needs to be things that are observable and not opinions. So you wouldn't map, this restaurant's really cool, but you'd re you could map, this is the name of the restaurant, the type of the cu cuisine, the um, phone number, these are the operating hours, that sort of thing. Um, but the overall goal is a free map of the entire world. Um, and we're not there yet, um, and we often say the mapping is never done, because um, you can make things as detailed uh, as you want, um, specific to your needs, uh, your hobbies, that sort of thing. So there's side projects, everything from things about hiking and bicycling to um, uh, specific projects about uh, handicap accessibility and those sorts of things. Um, so this probably seems familiar, but um, basically the open is that you're free to use and remix the OpenStreetMap data, and anyone is free to do that. But um, you must, in exchange, credit OpenStreetMap, and also if you make improvements and distribute them, they have to be open and available to everyone. So um, specifically, that's the Open uh, Data Commons Open Database License, or ODBL. Um, it's, it's similar to the Creative, Creative Commons CC by SA, um, except that was not appropriate for databases, so about a year and a half ago, the license was switched to ODBL. Um, so now I'm going to talk more specifically about HOT, um, and it's the same idea that most data that you, th oh, most mapping data and maps that you think are free are not. Or in some parts of the world, they don't exist at all. So we use open source and open data um, to respond to disasters, to prepare for disasters, and also work in the realm of economic development as well. And I'm going to go through some of our projects and the types of things we do. Um, so HOT's actually been in existence for quite a while. OpenStreetMap's been around nine years, and HOT, the idea of the humanitarian <coughs> OpenStreetMap team was presented about eight years ago. Um, the first official activation, and what I mean by activation is a call out to the community, uh, was in 2009 in Gaza. The OpenStreetMap community did a fundraiser to buy satellite imagery to then map the area, because there weren't good um, maps. Uh, there, weren't, there were good, weren't good maps of um, the pa Palestinian side, and the thought was this would help, um, making sure there was open and freely available map information available. Um, so the activation, as I said, is sort of a call out. This is, in general, done completely remotely um, by volunteers all over the world. And the idea is that anyone can help from the comfort of their own home or a mapathon or event to add and contribute information. Um, so the first, um, so then January 12th, um, 2010 happened. Uh, there was a huge earthquake in Port-au-Prince in Haiti. Hundreds of thousands of people died. Um, and what happened was very organic within the OpenStreetMap community. About three hours after um, the earthquake happened, a um, guy in Japan just started tracing uh, Port-au-Prince. Um, and by tracing, I mean he was using satellite uh, imagery that was already existing. Uh, at the time, Yahoo allowed us to use their satellite imagery. So it's the idea of looking at a picture and tracing roads and buildings and that sort of information. Um, and just an hour or so after that, 
Um, someone in Germany started doing the same thing. And then people sort of started talking to each other on IRC um, and through some of the mailing list channels, and more and more people began to contribute. And so what you saw was um, here on the left is the map ahead of time. Uh, there was a little bit of data already there. There weren't people actively mapping in Port-au-Prince. There weren't people running around with GPS units and doing sort of the general mapping that is OpenStreetMap, what their interests are. Um, an individual named Tim Waters had imported some already existing data um, that he had come across that was under an open license. But then, uh, but that was about all. But then if you fast forward about two weeks later, you have a very, very detailed map of Port-au-Prince. And then we, and th we started seeing things like, like this. Um, so this is a GPS unit um, with OpenStreetMap data on it being held by the head of a search and rescue team. Um, and the date on it is the 22nd of January. So we're not talking about very, very long after the earthquake, just 10 days. And you began to see maps in the United Nations, in the World Bank, um, all sorts of responders. Uh, one responder in particular walked into a tent and said, I need a map. Any map will do. But if you have OpenStreetMap, that would be great. And this is really the first time traditional responders were using OpenStreetMap uh, in their disaster response. And there were a couple reasons for this. There wasn't good map data available of Port-au-Prince. And the data that was available, the, um, the National Mapping Agency was having a meeting when the earthquake happened. Their building collapsed. For the first um, couple days, people didn't know where the backup of the, of the data of the geographic data of the country where it was. Because um, unfortunately, the uh, staff from the agency were in that building and had died and needed to you know, attend to their families and things like that. Um, OpenStreetMap was able to fill in that hole. The other thing is the earthquake had changed the landscape incredibly. So it was possible to update it um, to show those changes. Part of the thing that, one of the things that enabled that is um, Aerial photography was flown and released under a public domain license, or in the public domain um, by the World Bank. And um, satellite companies began to release information. We used out of copyright maps that had uh, road names and that sort of information. So then the question was, can you help the people living and working in Haiti learn to keep the map up to date themselves? So. Uh, HOT didn't actually exist as an organization at the time. We were just sort of a collection of individuals. And we began traveling to Haiti in March, so about two months after the earthquake, and began teaching people how to use the data, how to map, um, and just what the project was about. Uh, we went to Haiti five times that year. In August of that year, um, we formalized into a nonprofit organization because, uh, as you can imagine, it's very hard to um, arrange travel, worry about insurance and, a, and that sort of thing in a disaster area, just as a collection of individuals. Um, and we continue to work in Haiti today. Uh, there's um, a fairly large Haitian OpenStreetMap community, um, but we also have worked with organizations such as USAID in northern Haiti, which was not affected by the earthquake, just to uh, help and teach technology and open source so that there's freely available OpenStreetMap data for the entire country. Um, and similar to, as I said before, it's not complete. We haven't mapped it everywhere, but um, we continue to support Haitians in doing this sort of mapping. Um, and this sort of mapping as well. Um, this is a shot from our uh, project in northern Haiti. So um, some of the areas are quite remote, so driving around a motorbike with GPS. So then, um, in 2011, in, uh, the idea was, what if you mapped ahead of time? So hundreds and hundreds of people contributed to this map of Port-au-Prince, but it was done after the fact. Um, and so, um, what was AusAid at the time had um, spoke to us and said, what if we could map Indonesia ahead of time? Um, it's prone to a variety of disasters, um, and let's see if we can start an open street map community. Uh, and the reason for that, well, and these are, so these were the partners involved. So this is the World Bank, AusAid, um, and also BNPB is the Disaster Management Agency of Indonesia. Um, so the reason for this is they were building open source um, 
impact modeling software, which is now called InnoSafe. Uh, and the way, what impact modeling software is, um, is you have a hazard, so imagine a tsunami, or an earthquake or a flood, but then you need exposure data. So that would be the population, critical infrastructure. And together you can say, well, if this type of earthquake hit in this area with this population or um, these type of buildings, what would the result be? And with that information, you can then plan. Um, the problem was that exposure component, there were very good scientific models, hazard models available, but that exposure information of where critical infrastructure was didn't exist in the level of detail needed to um, use this type of modeling. Um, so this is um, just a screenshot from InnoSafe. It's a um, quantum GIS QGIS plugin. Uh, QGIS is a desk desktop uh, GIS software, geographic information systems. Uh, and it's a plugin for it. Um, if you're interested, uh, check it out and you can download it. Um, also with some sample data from InnoSafe.org. So the idea from the OpenStreetMap perspective was could we create a community and map once and have people use it for a bunch of different reasons? Uh, not just, we only cared about the disaster component and the exposure data, but you could make poverty maps, you could make tourism maps, um, and some members of commercial industry were involved because you can host this on your own infrastructure and not pay large API fees to, organ to Google, for example. Um, so map once, everyone then can use it. Uh, so one of the first things we did is we just went and did a bunch of uh, workshops, essentially. Uh, one of the major ones we did in, was in West Nusa Tenggara. So if you know where Bali is, the island next door, and the island next door to that, um, uh, to the east, that is where, where this is. Um, not that well known for its tourism, um, sort of a um, general uh, typical farming and mining and that sort of uh, uh, industry going on. So there were uh, community groups already doing mapping there. Some of it was on paper and some of it looked like the map behind me. This is a map that was done in Corel Draw. Um, so it's more of a picture than a map. You can't say, this is my latitude and longitude, where am I on this map? Um, it's colored in, so it's not being driven by data, but this is what they were doing. And what they would do is they would work with the community and determine what it means to be poor, what it means to be rich, where are the schools, where are the public toilets, and that sort of thing, and then produce a map like this. So the community could say, okay, all our poor people are over here, um, but none of our infrastructure and resources. So we came along and said, well, what about using OpenStreetMap? Um, it'll actually be geographic data, so you can put it on a GPS. Um, we'll also help you collect that poverty data, which is not an OpenStreetMap, um, but show you how to do analysis with it. So then the community can say, this is what it means to be poor, but if they change what it means to be poor, you don't have to go recolor in every little dot on the map. You can just use normal uh, data analysis, essentially. Um, and so this is a screenshot of one of the um, places that we, the, one of the first villages we mapped. Um, and so the idea was just, we're going to map every building. And that includes every house um, in the entire village. Uh, and we tried doing it with both GPS units and satellite imagery. We mapped another place as well. Um, and the reason I keep bringing up satellite imagery is um, it can be very difficult actually to obtain it. Um, you have to either own a satellite or pay someone that has one. Um, so we also tried using GPS since uh, with GPS you can buy a unit and then you can go map as many times as you want with it. Um, so what happened? Uh, just mapping in these couple uh, villages got everyone excited. Um, so in West Nusa Tenggara, the provincial government came forward and said, we want to be the map, best map province in all of Indonesia. Um, and they got the local uh, non-government organizations excited, universities, private companies, um, and, they continue, and they're continuing to map house by house. Um, and so there's thousands and thousands of houses mapped at this point, um, and they continued to keep mapping. 
What I thought was interesting is, um, so a lot of these maps, they were printing um, or hand drawing. But then I started getting pictures like this back. And what I thought was cool is this is a meeting in the evening in a community center. So the guys started taking the open source tools we had taught them and a projector around. And rather than just having the discussion on the paper with the community, projecting it on a wall and showing them how the tools worked as well. Um, which I thought was pretty awesome. Um, I, to get other people uh, mapping as well. And you know, the simple fact that you can hand all those tools to someone on a USB and they can, they can get going um, as long as they have a computer, uh, as opposed to having restrictions. So that was a fairly rural area we worked in. Then we worked with, um, in Jakarta. If you have the December, um, if you've seen the December uh, issue of Wired, there's a little blurb about this. Um, I'll actually say more that's, that's in that article in the next minute or two, um, just because it was a short summary. Uh, so there's 267 urban villages in Jakarta, and in the province proper, over 10 million people live there. In the um, region, it's more about 20 million. So the population changes greatly as people commute during the day. And the idea was, well, the problem is Jakarta is extremely uh, prone to flooding. It's essentially on top of a swamp, and it's slowly sinking. So could we invite the head of all 267 of these urban villages and ask them where stuff was, basically, um, and have university students help enter that data? So um, we did six workshops and um, had the students work with the village leaders to do this. Um, so here's just a shot from one of the workshops. One of the things we did is we sent paper maps out ahead of time and said, can you bring this back filled out? And some people did, some people didn't. Um, and then there, it was a matter of work, the students working with them and saying, well, are, are these all the schools that are available? Uh, and with some infrastructure like schools, we got handwritten lists that were available. So we were able to go through and check, check those off. But that was the list of schools that was available. Something handwritten that you could fax to someone or photocopy, but it wasn't digital. So part of this was making it available digital, digitally through OpenStreetMap. Um, and this is a sample of uh, just one of the maps that we sent back um, with the OpenStreetMap data on it. Okay, this is a bit dark, but um, when you Instagram something, you should probably plan that you're gonna need it in a presentation later. Uh, so January of last year, there was terrible flooding in Jakarta. Um, this is a shot, uh, myself and my team, we were out of town giving a workshop on the other side of the country, and this is a shot from the bus, basically, uh, trying to get home. Uh, and so the thing was, we had already done some mapping. Um, we had collected all this data. And so the OpenStreetMap data was used as the base of the map, base maps used by the disaster management agency, both the national and the provincial one, to share information about where the flooding had happened. Um, one of the other things we collected were neighborhood boundaries. Um, so um, below the village level, there's neighborhoods. And flooding's reported by those neighborhoods. They all have a unique uh, number. So you say the name of the village and then the unique number of the neighborhood. But the thing is, there was no geographic data set of that at a provincial level. So that was one of the other things we collected. So what that allowed to, people to do was report the flooding, but then show it on a map. Otherwise, it would just be like, be, for example, otherwise it would just say where it was in text, but that doesn't give you an idea of the extent of the flooding. It just tells you there are some places flooded. So this was the first time mapping ahead of time had then been used in a response. Um, and so after that, um, so after all this mapping, uh, to begin with this project was two of us that have done OpenStreetMap for a long time and two interns from the University of Indonesia. But that doesn't really scale, the four of us teaching people. Um, I still can't lead a workshop in Indonesian, uh, despite do doing quite a bit of study. So we um, recruited more trainers. So we had our, um, this trainer program. 
And we hired more people, uh, new graduates, from um, mainly from the University of Indonesia, which is uh, near Jakarta, um, to continue doing this training. Because the idea was it was a success. Um, we were able to collect data. Communities were interested, but they needed training. So here's the team out at karaoke night. Um, and so we've been um, traveling around. Uh, there's six provinces we've been focusing on giving workshops. Uh, and we no longer just give the workshops in OpenStreetMap. We're also responsible for the uh, QGIS training and the InnoSafe training. So providing a full training package of everything from collecting data to then doing analysis. Um, and so this has been going on. Um, we actually just finished, um, finished the, this particular project, and we're starting just this month um, for our third year of work doing this sort of training. Um, so what happened is we gave workshops um, to government officials, university students, um, local NGOs. Uh, it was dependent on the people we were working with in the provinces to determine who was attending the workshops. Uh, it worked pretty well, but not everyone you train becomes a mapper. Uh, people also just go to the, their training because their boss told them to. And maybe their boss isn't going to give them time to actually continue to use, and, uh, use that software. Um, but there were areas where a lot of uh, map, uh, where people did find the time to actually do that. Um, so here's an example. Um, so uh, this is the uh, longest river in um, Java. And um, almost 200 villages are reflected, affected by its flooding. So we had done workshops in this area, in East Java, but then went back to provide technical assistance. Uh, similar to the mapping in Jakarta, how would you do that mapping ahead of time to do analysis, to have a contingency plan? What are we going to do when things flood? Scouts helped us in this case. So when we've been doing this mapping, and this is true all over the world, you're never really sure who your mappers are going to be. Um, who's going to get excited about it? Who's actually going to go out um, and collect information? So a lot of this was um, the scouts in the area did that, did that mapping. Um, and just a couple more shots to sort of show what the extent of this was. Um, down in the bottom, these are all. Um, the maps we printed to actually just go collect the data. Uh, we use software um, called uh, Field Papers. And uh, here's an example of one here. And what it is, is it's just a piece of paper. But you have a QR code, and then you see there's some other markings. And what happens is you go print this piece of paper. You can go write on it, take a picture of it with your mobi mobile phone. It reads the QR code in the mapping markings, and then it's able to geo-reference it. So then you can take it in a map editor and have your notes, as well as the OpenStreetMap data, and add information. Um, most people, it's relatively easy to write on a map and do this. And it's scalable, too, because you just need to print paper. You don't need to make sure everyone has a, um, a smartphone or a GPS to go collect the data. So hundreds and hundreds of these were printed for this project. And that was how they collected the majority of the data. Um, so the, but the one thing with this is you already have to have um, you already have to have information. So for example, here the sort of pinkish uh, items are buildings. Well, to know that the grass is next to the building, the building has to be there so that you can relate things. Um, so in this case, what that meant was sitting down with satellite imagery and digitizing to create things like those buildings, so that people could then collect the more detailed information. Um, you know, because from space, you know there's a building there, but you don't know if it's a school, um, a government facility, or what it is. Um, and so this is one of the result maps. Um, so this is uh, looking at um, the specific uh, districts, uh, the number of people there, and then specifics about um, elderly people, children, and that sort of thing, um, and where the most affected districts would be. And then you can determine how much rice do we need stored, how much space do we need to evacuate people, and that those sort of decisions can be made ahead of time. Um, so through all these programs, um, we've created a lot of documentation. 
Um, hot doesn't create a lot of software. There's a little bit you'll see throughout this um, that we do create. But we create a lot of documentation about the software we use. So we have a three-part manual that came out of all these projects before. And so we're going to be submitting this to the Indonesian government to get it to become an official training program within the Disaster Management Agency. So you can actually go through these materials and receive a certification in contingency planning using OpenStreetMap in, in a safe. Um, and the training materials, of course, are also open, openly licensed, um, available in English and Indonesian. Um, but we're starting to get more and more translations. Uh, it's currently being translated into French, for example. Um, and, it, and this program's gone to all levels of government in Indonesia. Um, this is uh, the president of Indonesia uh, getting a briefing on the impact modeling of the Jakarta floods. So there's really been quite a lot of exposure um, and really sort of a, a really an innovative approach um, to doing this sort of analysis. So I talked a lot, long time about Indonesia. Uh, part of that is it's our largest project. Um, I live there, um, and so I spend a lot, of, a lot of my time working on it. But we, ha we have projects all over the place. Um, so this pro project um, we called um, Eurosia was through um, the European Union, and it was to support youth volunteers, which is 18 to 26, um, to live six months in a country and help a local partner with uh, information management. Um, so using OpenStreetMap to create basic map data. Um, there's some crisis management software called Sahana. Um, so that can be used for things like inventory tracking um, and, uh, and response type information as well. So um, we helped train these volunteers to go then live in Africa, in uh, Kenya, uh, Burkina Faso, uh, the Central African Republic, and Chad. Um, if you've been reading the news, um, the wor work in the Cent Central African Republic ended abruptly, though, um, because it became too dangerous to work there. Um, so we also work with the World Bank. Um, there's a project initiative called Open Cities. Um, the goal is to map 100 cities in Asia that are prone to disaster. Um, the initial programs are in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. Um, and so with that, a lot of what we do is providing training. Because um, the tools are out there, but it, it can be difficult to, to get started if, if you have no idea um, where to start. And so every, people in these pictures are using those same tools. Uh, we've also been working quite a bit in Senegal. Um, through uh, the Foundation of France and in partnership with OpenStreetMap France, as well as the World Bank. Uh, the idea to create, can we help foster an OpenStreetMap community there as well? Um, working, there's some um, co-working and hacker spaces there uh, who we've worked with, as well as just going out into the community and working with universities to give workshops. Um, and then we have projects in um, the, in countries that we may, well, we've, we've done some, a little bit of work in countries where you don't think necessarily that there's um, probably a lack of map data. Um, this is in Kamashi in um, Japan, one of the areas um, heavily um, devastated by the tsunami. Um, and what we did was we just went with OpenStreetMap Japan, who did a whole lot of mapping um, immediately after the tsunami. And we'll continue do ma doing mapping as people build back. So we just actually went along with them to see sort of how they were ma doing mapping um, to uh, sort of foster relationships with those communities as well and just see um, how we could help. Uh, and then we've actually done some projects sort of accidentally as well that don't have to do with OpenStreetMap. Uh, this is a screenshot from MapMill. Uh, and myself and Skylar Earl, what we had done is we were at a training exercise uh, in California. And the Civil Air Patrol of the United States is the Air Force Auxiliary. Uh, and they have about 500 Cessnas. So when a disaster happens in the United States, these guys go up and, uh, with uh, just a regular SLR camera 
on their GPS, and they take a bunch of pictures. And those pictures get handed on a DVD to the incident commander or someone else, and they maybe don't even get looked at, because it's a lot of pictures. But they're extremely useful, because you know where the plane was when the picture was taken, and then you have a high, fairly high resolution picture. And so what we did is we modified the public laboratory's map mill project, which was used for um, sorting kite photography, just to say, say this picture's good, this picture's bad, and figure out what you wanted to use, instead to rank damage. So it's just no damage, some damage, destroyed. And so we did this in about two days. We sort of stuck it on GitHub and then didn't really think about it. Um, and, but then uh, Hurricane Sandy hit New York. And the Civil Air Patrol guys said, we're going to go fly a bunch of, um, bunch of the east coast of the United States and take pictures. Uh, can you get that software you worked on up? So um, Sky Skylar got this all set up um, to do the sorting. Um, took us a couple tries on the server, actually, because so many people helped. So we thought, OK, maybe a couple hundred people will sort images. 6,000 people helped sort images. Not a good choice for your micro Amazon free account. <laughs> <laughs> so we got ourselves straightened out. Um, and then this was used. Um, so what we had did, done is made a grid um, uh, using what's called national grid, which is the same as military grid. Um, so you have a grid of where things are, um, or rather sort of XY coordinates. Um, and the pictures were associated with a grid. So then you could get an average of where there was no damage, where there was moderate damage, where there was severe damage. And then teams could actually go assess on the ground that way. So it was fairly simple. It helped people. Um, and instead of having to check everywhere, you could focus on the, hard, focus on the hardest hit areas first. Um, and we also work quite a bit with the American Red Cross. Um, and so one of the things we do with them is they ask our volunteers to help digitize satellite imagery. And then Robert Bannock, who's um, in their international section is a GIS person, goes and gives workshops uh, regarding OpenStreetMap and mapping. Um, so here's the result of that. Um, this is a fire risk map. And I'll show you on the next page uh, why a fire risk map was needed in Uganda. So you can imagine these types of huts um, burn very easily. So, um, so we aren't always the ones actually traveling and teaching people to do the mapping. We, actually, the majority of our volunteers are just all over the world doing mapping, building software, doing documentation um, from the comfort of their own home. So um, to speak a little bit more to these types of activations where volunteers are helping remotely. Um, so Typhoon Haiyan um, hit about a month, ago, the Philippines about a month and a half ago. And um, the OpenStreetMap Philippines community uh, works very closely with HOT. Because unfortunately, the, these, not these sorts of typhoons, but there are cyclically typhoons every year there. Um, and so before it hit, they said, well, this looks like it's going to be bad. And people started mapping a couple days beforehand. Um, so November 7th, which is about 48 hours before, um, uh, about 10,000 buildings had been mapped in Tacloban. Um, and this had been, um, sorry, I can't read the red from here. Uh, the th 33 um, mappers had helped do this. Um, and this is uh, Tacloban, which was one of the hardest hit areas. And uh, so this was the map after the mapping had happened. So you can see from here, though, there are things that you could not tell from satellite imagery that were mapped. And part of the reason was the um, OpenStreetMap Philippines community had done workshops and been there and done mapping um, just, just a, a couple weeks before, actually. Um, but the detail where all the buildings had been mapped had not been done yet. Um, and so after that, um, more and more people began to help. Uh, this is a screenshot from, we call this the OpenStreetMap Tasking Manager. And what it is, is, is a coordination tool. 
uh, it allows you to pick a specific, an administrator to set up a specific area to map, and then ask people to do something. Um, usually it's things like trace all the buildings, trace all the roads, that sort of thing. And so here are some of the tasks related to the type in. Um, so after you select a task, um, it goes to the screen like this. So the map on the, uh, the, map on the right shows um, what areas haven't been mapped at all, would have been done, and would have been validated. And then you have your instructions on the left, um, why we're doing it, what the workflow is, and then some statistics and the users of who, who are helping. Uh, so after this, you, someone can go in and say, take a task. So this is um, after you've taken a task. And what it does now is it assigns you your square. Um, and what you can do then is map um, in that square whatever the specific instructions are. Um, and it links directly to a bunch of the OpenStreetMap uh, tools. Uh, we also uh, coordinate largely through wikis. Um, so along with having the tasking manager help show people where to map, um, there's more general coordination here. Because uh, what happens um, usually after an event is people start making um, data products available and tools that didn't exist before or didn't exist for the whole world. Um, and so that sort of information is posted here so people have access to it. Um, and here's an example of one of the um, one of the products that was created that didn't exist before. Um, so this is made by the American Red Cross, and what it was looking at was the all the buildings that open, had been traced from OpenStreetMap, and then a damage model of uh, combined together to try to estimate where the uh, buildings were the most damaged in Tacloban. Um, and here's another product just looking at where the um, prior priority areas were that were traced. Because um, actually one of the hardest things is actually coordinating. Um, because a, a bad event, an event happens, a, a bad disaster, and people want to help. But what do you do with all those people that want to help? Um, so that's one of the key is, keys is being able to tell people what to do and also say where we're working. Um, so as I've been talking about satellite imagery, but what did we need to help further? We needed photos taken after the typhoon. Um, and this can be fairly difficult to get. Um, there's, a, there's a charter called the Disaster Charter, which is um, satellite providers and governments uh, together. And so tr in traditional response or organizations and countries, you can activate the Disaster Charter. So the Philippines, for example, could say, um, we need help. Um, we need satellite imagery, um, but small volunteer organizations uh, such as OpenStreetMap don't have access to that. Because um, the data is released for a limited time, but usually under a very specific license. But um, five days after the storm, um, HOT received satellite uh, imagery from the Humanitarian in Information Unit of the U.S. State Department. Um, and the reason we're able to receive that is there's a program called Imagery to the Crowd. And the US State Department saw that after the um, earthquake in Haiti, that having volunteers have access to satellite imagery was really able to help the response. And so Digital Globe is, um, produces much of the satellite imagery that you think of when you look in Google Earth or Microsoft Maps and things like that. Um, the US government, um, actually has a license where they have the right to any of those pictures that are taken from this commercial satellite. And it's the same satellite data you or I could go buy, um, of course, at a cost. Uh, so, so we're able to access it through that NextView license, license, which is called NextView. Um, and that's how it was released to us. Um, and Digital Globe then, actually, and the US government actually then released the satellite imagery um, of the area for 30 days openly after this. Because uh, one of the things that's been, that's been uh, talked about time and time again um, is if you provide access to data openly, um, 
like the satellite imagery. You don't know what people are going to do with it. You don't know that this many people are going to be able to help. And then um, someone responding actually physically on the ground just needs a map to know where they're going to deliver aid. Um, and this is just the imagery to the crowd initiative um, from the US State Department. Um, and so here is a, oops. So this is a bef before picture and then this is an after. So you can see many, many houses um, and buildings um, were completely demolished. And what you can do with having the before picture is you can say that building was there. And what you can do with the after is you say it was damaged or destroyed. Um, but you need both components to be able to do that. Um, and this is just a screenshot from the Java OpenStreetMap editor uh, showing um, just all the vectors that were added um, of Takloban using that imagery. Um, so we have all this data, but what were people use, doing with it? Um, as I mentioned before, field papers um, simply allows people to print maps, um, and then you can print maps and write on them and then upload them and use them to edit, edit data. But honestly, a lot of people just use it to print maps. It creates a nice atlas of the OpenStreetMap data, and then you can go use it as a map. This is uh, one of the indexes on those maps. Um, and then there's other simple things that were provided. Um, th there's a German company that uh, does a lot of OpenStreetMap consulting called the Geofabric. And what they do is um, provided was just different file format extracts of the data. Um, so if you imagine, as I've been saying, with OpenStreetMap, people can map their interests. Well, maybe you only need specific data. Maybe you just need the roads file, for example. So what this does is it parse, they, they parsed out specific um, formats um, so that people could use it. Because uh, otherwise, uh, the normal way to access the OpenStreetMap data is you need to download what we call the planet file, so the whole planet, um, and then chop out what you need. So a lot of organizations provide specific extracts of it. Um, this is the Disaster Management Agency of the Philippines. So they were using the OpenStreetMap data just as a simple base map. Um, if you want to put a web map to together and then show um, relief, type, um, relief type information, you still need the base map just so that people can reference, reference themselves. Um, and so this is, um, and then this is the Tacloban Airport, so the um, city that I've been showing you. Um, and these are members of the International Organization on Migration in the United Nations. So what was sent down was those um, sort of plastic banners, um, tarps that you print for events. So um, Manning Semble, one of the OpenStreetMap guys, uh, printed those and sent them down. Um, and so they're hanging in the airport so everyone has access to a large map of the area. So I checked last night because the number keeps going up. So after, as of January 6th, almost 1,700 people have helped contribute to this map of the Philippines um, since the typhoon. And almost 5 million map changes have been made. So really, an incredible volunteer effort has happened. Um, and we're continuing to do some mapping with that, but we also have current activations. Um, there's always something that needs to map, be mapped somewhere. Um, so tasks.hotawesome.org is where our tasking manager is. So it's always possible just to go check there. Um, and there's instructions, and also you just need an OpenStreetMap account to get started. Um, so in this, one of the places we're working is the Central African Republic. Um, and so just providing base map information there. Um, and also in South Sudan as well. Um, and in both cases, we've been um, seeing what freely available geographic information is available and importing it into OpenStreetMap when appropriate, and then tracing satellite imagery. We're working closely with um, HIU at the US State Department to specifically request imagery. Because um, one of the things with pro having imagery provided to us um, through that program, or any program, you can't really say, we want all the imagery. No one's going to give it to you. So you need to prioritize 
well, if we had imagery here, we could really help. Um, and there's a high need here. Um, and, if, and if you have time here, too, it would also be good. Um, there's always GitHub. Um, so the tasking manager, for example, is um, something that was built by Hot. Um, and then we have some other program, programs for extracting data and that sort of thing. Um, as well as this is where our um, documentation is uh, kept as well. So if you speak another language um, and are interested in translating, um, or even just if you were using the documentation and there's a mistake or something. Um, so we have a technical working group um, that meets uh, at sort of a terrible time for here. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, every other Monday, but we also discuss things on our mailing lists as well. Um, and also, we're uh, part of the Digital Humanitarian Network at digitalhumanitarians.com, which is, I think we're at 20 partner organizations now. Um, and what this is, is it's a place for these volunteer organizations doing uh, digital volunteerism, digital humanitarian work, um, to coordinate. Because um, one of the big things, um, HOT's not the only organization that does this, um, but if you're an organization, organization like the United Nations, you may not know how to get involved in an open source community. Where do you ask for help? So the Digital Humanitarian Network is sort of is a contact point for that. And then, um, so for, I'm a coordinator, and then there's three other coordinators. So someone can email and say, I have this problem. Can you help me solve it? And then work with our partners to see who might be able to assist. Uh, I also mentioned you can volunteer in person on a project. We also have, we also have paid work as well. Um, and these are all always posted on our website. Um, and sometimes it's um, just having general technical skills um, is, is a help. Or uh, recently, um, someone came to Jakarta for two weeks and ran a Python class for people who had never programmed before. Um, so there's a lot of different ways. And um, all those ways are at our websites at hot.openstreetmap.org. And if you click on the Get Involved um, button, um, both those sorts of positions are listed there, as well as um, some of the other things I talked about, like where the specific GitHub repositories are and what the specific projects are. So um, what's most important to me, and I always feel like I'm sort of doing a little bit of recruiting, is uh, remember that you can help. And also, if you are in a situation where you need data, um, that this is available as well. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, but it's also possible for the data just to be under a license that's okay. So um, um, in Japan, for example, they spend a lot of time talking to the government, asking them for permission to use data um, or use satellite data as well. Maybe at a satellite source somewhere and say, hey, oh, that's what no. it looks like. <laughs> You're not supposed to do that, right? Right, you can't copy from other maps. So um, not even copying, you can't just like inspire yourself from something else. <laughs> um, it, copying's a funny thing, because at what extent are you essentially breaking the license? Um, the OpenStreetMap community is very, very strict on license, stricter than um, most other communities, um, where sometimes it can actually be difficult to uh, determine if you can use data because of that. Um, and, and I think just one of the reasons is this focus on there isn't other available data, the open data. Um, so basically, you would need some sort of open license of whatever you're copying from. Um, there are community guidelines related to how much copying is okay, but it's, but it's very small amounts. And it really, the, whatever you're using as a source needs to already be open. Um, and a lot of this information is collected by people actually going and traveling to those places and mapping it, or using satellite data. The one thing that I didn't mention is Microsoft um, Bing Maps allows the use of their satellite data. So there is a lot of satellite data that, that can be used. Um, it just doesn't cover the entire world. Mm -hmm. there, there are several. Um, I'm hoping to do a lot of work with the um, with, with, with government agencies and we'll be funded by them as well. Um, there, there, there are certain areas that many governments would prefer not to be mapped, and I, I think we can all think what those might be. <laughs> have, have, do you have any um, interesting stories about some conflicts you've run into in that area? Um, I think the most, the biggest example is the name tag for Jerusalem. Uh, this isn't actually government, this is like a community conflict. It says, so with OpenStreetMap, you can have things in as many languages as you want. There's the default name tag, and then uh, you'd have like the name English tag, and the name Hebrew tag, et cetera. And the default name tag is supposed to be whatever the language is where it is. Um, but the name tag for there is actually blank, and it says, you're gonna get, you will be blocked if you, if you edit this tag. And it's because there was no community consensus. Um, and so that sort of thing, so with government, it's the same thing comes into effect, where we don't want, the we don't want people locally to get in trouble, but they, they lead things. Because um, there are countries where mapping military bases, for example, is illegal. Um, but if you're in another country and you're just tracing the military base, they can't really, come get you, but if you live in that country, so the, the local community um, comes up with their own guidelines for that sort of thing. Um, and we do have a data working group for when it goes beyond what people can negotiate on their own. Working? Yeah, I've seen you could, obviously doing a lot of work mapping new areas and also identifying existing areas that have had damage, but I wonder what the challenges are or if it's a challenge to keep areas updated with only incremental changes. So I imagine spotting those changes, no matter what data you're looking at, is probably quite challenging. Is that something that is a problem or is not a problem or how does that work? Um, I think the biggest thing is um, a lot of our work is um, developing community, local communities. Um, because if you live somewhere and you use the map every day and a road all of a sudden opens or is closed, you're gonna know. If you're on the other side of the world, you're not. Um, so a big, a big part is having a local community because um, there is quite a bit of discussion of, in some of these places, if you go map like crazy and then no one there locally ever looks or uses the map, it'll probably get out of date very quickly. G'day. Following along from that question, actually, in the Wikipedia sort of space, uh, there's been quite a lot of quite a lot published recently about the changes in the way material is getting edited, and there are less people editing, and they're editing in different ways and things like that. Have you? Is there a change in the way data is being in the workflow of data updates on, in the Open Maps project? Um, so the biggest thing is um, OpenStreetMap's actually been successful in releasing a new editor that's easy to use. So if you look at like Wikipedia and the struggle to have a WYSIWYG editor. Um, in 
It's been out for about a year, because um, I think the beta was January last year. Um, there's, a, there's a new editor, and it's just the base editor when you log into OpenStreetMap.org. Um, is a lot easier than any of the other editors. If you have an account um, and some basic computer and map literacy, you can just immediately start editing. So the, edit, the amount of active editors has been going up. Um, and I think the big part of that is the tools are easier. And if you even look within our responses, um, the first month after the earthquake in Haiti, 600 people edited. If you look at Typhoon Haiyan, 1,700 people have edited in a month. So um, I think with the tools getting easier, there's actually more contributors. Um, I don't know if that'll change if the map's going to start looking finished and people are like, ah, oh, well, it's done. Um, but at the moment, it's continuing to grow. One of the things that interested me when you're talking about um, the little neighborhoods and that each neighborhood had a number, uh, and there are a lot of particular details that are local to that area that a, a person from another country may not know. How do you go about finding that kind of thing out? Um, so, with the countries we physically work in, um, we work with locals, um, but it, it, can be, it can be hard um, with, with a, lot of, a lot of the remote work, you're really doing a fast mapping to provide something, because nothing's there. Um, but then adapting things to the local context um, takes, takes some time. Um, so for Indonesia is the biggest example of that. A lot of the stuff we did was translation, just of the software. Um, and also um, teaching people how to do map making. Because, for example, let, let's say the symbol H for hospital. Well, in Indonesian, it's RS for rumah sakit. So that doesn't necessarily make sense to people. Um, or uh, there's many different levels of health clinics. And the OpenStreetMap tagging originally just had clinic. But there, there's three different types of clinics. And it's important to know which type each is, um, depending on your needs. Okay. Thank you very much for okay. that talk. Thank you. <laughs> so here's a uh, wonderful